Morning, church. Let's make them feel welcome. Yes. Yes, as they've come to uh, bring the word of the Lord to us both this morning and this evening. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, again, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, before I begin with the rest of our announcements this morning, kids, you all are dismissed. Head to your classes. Thank you, sister. All right. If I could have our ushers come forward and pass out this morning's uh, lesson for Sunday school and take up the tithes and offering. <clears throat> we have Friends and Family Sunday coming up next week, April the 21st. You've all invited a bunch of people already, right? Yeah. Awesome. If you haven't yet, you've got a week to do so, okay? There are handouts out in the vestibule. Please, adults, take those and pass them out. Be intentional about talking to somebody you want to see in the house of the Lord. Bring some friends and family and bring them for lunch. Lunch on the grounds after the friends and family service. Again, I said it before, I'll say it again. Probably this is a very special and very important um, event we do every year because this is where my family got our start in the church. So these are important events. Please bring friends and family, invite someone to be there, be in prayer this week for the service. We want to see people changed, right? The whole purpose isn't just to hang out, just to have a good time, although that's fun. We want to see lives changed. We want others to know the truth that we know and enjoy uh, the Lord and that relationship we get to have with him through the Holy Spirit. So be sure to sign up to bring something. Key last part here. We need food, right? So sign up. There's a sign up in the vestibule. Please sign up to bring something for the lunch and plan to stay all day, stay all afternoon. There will be no evening service next week. All right, with that said, hold on a minute. Are the ladies excited? They're excited for ladies' conference coming up. Yes, so all of our ladies are coming uh, the 25th through the 27th of April, going to be gone to uh, Branson, Missouri, for the Kingdom Come Conference. Your funds for the event are due today. So if you have not already made those arrangements, please see Sister Stephanie or Sister Martin and take care of that. Coming up in a few weeks, we have Brother and Sister Uzel coming again on the 28th of April. So we are excited to be able to host them again. Uh, and let them come and bring the word. We have an exciting couple of months. Boy, spring is in the air, and it is feeling busy. We have the Azalea Parade coming up on May the 5th. So we need parade candy. If you haven't already started bringing some candy in, bring some candy. Give those donations to Sister Martin, please. On that Sunday, May the 5th, we will be having those that are on the float in the parade leaving the church at 11 o'clock. You guys have to go get lined up and ready for the parade. The rest of us will join afterwards. Please plan to participate. Um, we we want to have a good turnout and be able to show um, folks in the town who, what we're about, right, who we are. Again, this is one of those early events we started with that I was like, man, these people are crazy, but this is cool. <laughs> so, again, bring some parade candy. Plan to be a part of the parade on the May the 5th. And um, bring a sack lunch because we will not be stopping before the parade. It's kind of a go, go, go. Um, Coming up on the 22nd of May, there is no Bible study that evening. The suitors will be on some much-needed vacation time. So plan now for May the 22nd to host a Bible study in your home or with some friends. Go to the park. It's beautiful weather, hopefully. Uh, find a pavilion in case it's raining. But make some preparations. You guys have time? May the 22nd. Let's still be in the Word that evening, even if we're not gathered together here in this place. Amen? All right, with that, Pastor Mike, I'm going to pass this over to you. Josh, if I could reiterate one of the things Brother Josh was talking about with the parade candy, um, if you have purchased parade candy to bring to for the Azalea Parade and you think that you have brought enough, double it and bring more. I'm not joking. We need a lot of parade candy. Every year we end up having more parade candy, and it seems like we run out sooner. Because we like to pass out candy in the parade, and people like to receive candy in the parade. So if you can, if you can at all donate some, please, I encourage you. Um, questions about it, see Sister Martin. I can tell you we will not be doing chocolates, peppermints, butterscotch, other hard candies that you know, can give kids concussion when you throw them too hard. So that, we're not about hurting kids. We're about making them you know, sugar-filled and hyper to send them home. No, I don't. I've actually lost 30 pounds this year. <laughs> no, um, and I know Brother Josh is already welcome, Brother and Sister Bentley, but I have to say that I am grateful to have Brother and Sister Bentley with us. 
These are some elders. Go ahead, church. They're, they, they deserve it. These are some elders that have spoken into mine and my wife's life a tremendous amount over the last 20 years we've been in this church. And so I am honored to have Brother and Sister Bentley with us. And I will tell you this, um, what you have sitting in here are former missionaries. And I got to sit down to dinner with them. Me and Owen got to sit down with di uh, to dinner with them last night. And the stories they can tell, the wisdom you can glean from that, and the amount of laughter you'll get from that is unmatched. So if you get a chance to talk with Brother and Sister Bentley, please do so. And lastly, if as you were coming in, I'm sure you saw a table set up in the vestibule right beside the water fountain. Those are all books that Sister Bentley has either authored or co-authored. And, and a couple Bible studies, if I remember correctly. Uh, you don't want to miss them. She is a very a fantastic, prolific author, so make sure to stop by her table, pick up some books, and she will have an opportunity to push her books uh, here in a little while because she gets to preach to us this morning, and I'm excited about that. Amen. Well, without further ado, I say we get into the Word of the Lord. Amen? Um. Well, I say without further ado, I just realized I've not gone through our prayer, prayer request. We need to do that real quick. Sister, uh, Sister Tammy Mahaffey uh, needs prayer. She has sprained her arm. She's not sure how she's done it, but she is currently in a sling, so the Lord needs to touch her. Uh, her youngest son, Elisha, currently has RSV and is in need of a healing from God. And Brother Charles needs a touch of the Holy Ghost. So if we could stand as we pray, Sister... Yes, need to lift up Brother John. Yeah, that's not like him. He's not the type to come home from work early. He's the type to take on extra hours. So the fact that he came home from work early means he's not feeling good. So please, let's lift up Brother John Wheelahan. And also, Sister Anna, um, I've not heard an update this week, but the last update I heard, it was not good. Um, she's still fighting cancer, and the doctors aren't thinking it's very promising, but I know a God. We've seen God heal cancer before in this house. I believe we'll see him do it again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we worship you, Jesus, because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We come to you in this moment knowing, God, that every single need that we lift up before you, you can touch, you can heal. Lord, we pray right now for Sister Tammy that you would heal her arm, Lord, whatever's going on, whatever's sprained in it. Lord, we're praying for your healing virtue to touch her, cause the inflammation to... to, to Calm down, Lord Jesus, and just touch her, Lord. I lift up Elisha, that the RSV virus would be cast from his body, that you'd heal his, heal his lungs, heal his respiratory system, Lord God. Help him to breathe more clearly, Lord God. And in the name of Jesus, I lift up Brother Charles, Lord. He needs a touch of your spirit right now. God, I pray wherever he's at in this moment, that your glory would begin to fall upon him, begin to move upon him, Jesus, and begin to shift him from the inside out, Lord. I lift up Brother John, Lord. I know he is not feeling well, God. I know he wanted to be here this morning, but God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus, that you'd reach down to him with your Holy Spirit, touch him and heal him in his home. God, I pray bring restoration to his health in the name of Jesus, along with Sister Anna, Lord, I'm praying for restoration. God, we know that you are a healer of all things. God, we've seen you heal cancers before. We've seen you open blinded eyes. We've seen you bring the dead to life. And God, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing upon Sister Anna's body, Lord. I speak to that tumor and to these cancer cells to be cast out in the name of Jesus. Lord, according to your word and according to your power, God, let it be so. Let the doctors see what is going on and be able to ascribe nothing but a miracle to it, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I speak this over her, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And while you are standing, if we could turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 27. Brother Josh has it up on the screen for us. This is our opening text for this morning's lesson. And it reads, But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Thank you for honoring the word of the Lord, and you may be seated in Jesus' name. What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? And as we'll discuss here in just a few moments, there was actually some additional implication. I mean, we look at it, if somebody were to step outside and speak to, the, speak to a storm and immediately it calmed down, we would be absolutely flabbergasted with the kind of miracle that was, right? It would absolutely blow you away. But when it comes to the culture of the ancient Near East and the culture in which these disciples lived at the time, there was a whole lot more to it than that. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. But I want you to understand that when God stood there on that boat and he said, peace be still, and everything obeyed, 
It was his exertion of power as the almighty God. That was Jesus looking to the world and saying, look, I am God. So if I were to, this might sound a little random after having said that. If I were to ask you if you could have any masterpiece, any work of art, any painting hanging in your home, what would you choose to have? For some people, they would like a Picasso. Their Picasso's work is very abstract. Michelangelo has some beautiful sculptures. But there's a famous artist by the name of Rembrandt. I'm sure many are familiar with him. Um, this is one of his paintings right here. He's painted hundreds of scapes on canvas, but this is the only seascape he ever painted. This one is known as Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He painted this in 1633. In the Lexham Geographic Commentary, Gordon Franz tells us the story of this special work of art. He says, a keen eye for geography and theology may pick up a few interesting features in Rembrandt's depiction of the storm. He was painting in Amsterdam, not at the Sea of Galilee. He didn't have the luxury of watching a ship toss in toss and list in Israel, but he painted what he thought might have been might have looked and what it, what he thought it might have felt and looked like. Further, although the biblical account tells us Jesus was on board and his twelve disciples. We count 14 men on board the boat in the painting. Since Jesus was already on board, we conclude this painting is a depiction of the storm, uh, of the storm that he calmed with only his word. Franz then goes on to describe the painting as, quote, the panic-stricken disciples in their fishing boat trying to regain control of the vessel after being caught in a sudden fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee. A huge, violent wave is crashing over the bow, and the sail is ripping as the boat draws perilously close to some rocks. There are 14 people in this boat, if you were to count them. Jesus, his 12 disciples, and a 14th individual. Most likely, many scholars believe, to be Rembrandt himself, because he was known to paint himself into most of his pictures. One of the disciples is shown leaning over the edge of the boat, apparently seasick and vomiting, and it was... It was Consider it was probably Judas since he was the only non-Galilean amongst the 12 disciples. From the city of Kirioth, south of Hebron in the Negev of Judah, he was not accustomed to sailing in a boat, and so likely he probably would have been the one puking overboard. Rembrandt's masterpiece prominently hung, uh, prominently hung in Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum until March of 1990, when two men posing as police officers stole it along with a dozen other works of art. To date, none of these works have been recovered. It is fitting that one of the stolen works of art was Rembrandt's Christ in the Storm. We all know what it feels like to be displaced and fearful as we face storms. We know what it feels like to be looking ahead at things going on or situations and circumstances in life and wondering, God, how are you going to get me through this? Thankfully, like the disciples today, we don't face those storms alone. When circumstances in life come against us, we don't have to just sit there and say, okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to navigate that, but we have the opportunity to say, Lord, it's in your hands. God, if you'll but speak peace, or better yet, hold my hand through it. And maybe one of these days we could be like Peter walking on top of the waves. You see, in the New Testament, it's, Rich in its use of Old Testament scriptures, the, the quoting, the paraphrasing, the allusions to the Hebrew scriptures. Approximately 800 times throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament is quoted, paraphrased, or mentioned. Both Testaments, as you can imagine, are centered on Jesus Christ. The Old Testament pointing ahead to the coming Messiah. And in the era of the New Testament, it's He has come. To help the disciples understand the scriptures, Jesus said in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he said, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. New Testament writers would quote the, uh, the book of Psalms more than any other book. 206 references to the Psalms punctuate the New Testament. The book of Psalms was like 
what we would quantify as a hymnal today. You know, we see the little red books in the back of pews that have all the old songs that so many people love and hold dear. This is what the book of Psalms was to the New Testament church. It's interesting and important to note how the Psalms are intentionally arranged. As many of us may have picked up, or some may have not, the book of Psalms is actually arranged and organized into five separate smaller books. Book 1 would be Psalms 1 through 41. Book 2, Psalms 42 through 72. Book 3, 73 through 89. Book 4, 90 through 106. And book 5, 107 through 150. And the interesting thing about the book of Psalms is while they are songs of praise, while they're uh, songs of lament, while they're a hymnal for all intents and purposes, there's a tremendous amount of power and prophecy found in those books, found amongst those scriptures. It is no reason, it is no wonder why when we are in the midst of the strong praise and worship service that God does miracles in our midst. It's no wonder why when the praise team is getting up here singing, I've got a reason to praise, somebody's down here receiving their reason to praise. There's no wonder why people are receiving the Holy Ghost as the praise team is, is playing to their, to, to, with all that they've got. There's no reason why we're seeing signs and wonders and miracles when the praise team is up just giving God everything they have. And there's no reason why you leave this house the same way when you sit on your tail end while the music plays. Excuse me for a moment if I have to call some of us out on the fact that when God is worthy of praise, we sit down and do nothing. The books of praise, the psalms of praise are powerful, they're prophetic, they're miracle working because when you entertain the presence of God, let me tell you something friend, when you entertain the presence of God, the Holy Spirit moves freely and there's nothing that is impossible with my God. When you but call upon the name of Jesus, sickness must flee, darkness must be cast out, cancer must be healed. Because that's the power of the presence of my God. So it's no wonder that when the New Testament writers speak of the Psalms, they hold them in extremely high regard. Psalm chapter 65 verse 7 speaks of God when it says, Which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. And as you can imagine, as the disciples boarded the ill-fated boat, marveled at the, at the great calm. It is not hard for us to imagine them saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Because the thing that was different about the culture back then, we, we believe in people who operate in the gifts of the Spirit, Amen. We believe in signs, wonders, and miracles, tongues and interpretation, miraculous healings. Amen? It's something we see prevalently in this house, or rather we should, might I, might I say. It is nothing for us to hear of a storm coming through and pray, God, hold back the wind, hold back the rain, because whatever the need is, is, is present. And there's been times we've actually watched the radar, and I don't remember what the reason was, uh, we watched the radar, a big, thick thundercloud was headed straight towards Fredericktown, and we needed the rain to be held off for some reason or another, and we prayed, and you literally watch as the radar, the cloud would split, go around Fredericktown, and then come back together. Hallelujah. I don't know why, other than God. So these things, while we consider them miraculous, they seem fairly normal to us, that somebody can pray, and something happens in the storms. Well, in this day and age, in the first century... The thing was, it was believed that the only one who could control the, the wind and the waves and the storms had to be a god. And I say a god because in the ancient Near East, there were, they believed in a lot of gods. And so when Jesus, frustrated with his disciples, gets up and says, Peace, be still to the storm. All of a sudden, they recognized, you know, they, they knew this entire time that they were walking with Messiah. But in that moment, they realized he's more than just Messiah. Jesus is God. Psalm 65 identifies God three times as Elohim in verses 1, 5, and 9. 
We even read brilliant flashes of messianic hope in verses 2, 3, and 5, such as, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. And then, by terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of, of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea. You see, only God stills the noise of the seas and the waves. But wondrously, when we cross into the New Testament, Jesus stood at the edge of the boat and calmed the seas, calmed the waves, calmed the storm. The book of Psalms and the Gospels sing a duet of the divinity of Jesus Christ himself as the Father of heaven, robed in flesh, dwelling among us, as John wrote. You see, storms in our lives look very different than they did for the disciples. I look across this congregation, I'm pretty confident I don't see a single person who has spent their livelihood sailing the Sea of Galilee fishing for a living. And in fact, the, and in fact, the only sailor that I know of is not here this morning, and he was a sailor in the United States Navy, and those boats are a little bit different than what they had on the Sea of Galilee. And so our storms might look a little bit different. Their storm in Matthew chapter 8 was an actual storm. Wind and waves, rain, thunder, lightning, and great winds. And certainly, yes, we still have thunderstorms. A couple of years ago in October, we had a tornado rip through Fredericktown. Knocked the power out here in town for about a week, week and a half, if I remember correctly. But we also have storm shelters. We have umbrellas, windshield wipers, sandbags. We have buildings that can withstand tornadoes. But windshield wipers can't stave off COVID. An umbrella can't stop a divorce notion. A storm shelter won't save you from a foreclosure notice. Sandbags can't protect you from being laid off. Just like any other storm, if you can imagine being the loved one of a public servant, when at 3 a.m. you hear a knock on your door with an officer and a chaplain standing on your doorstep. No, our storms don't look the same, but we still have storms. We row through these storms in our lives. We still fight and struggle just sometimes to keep our head above water. I can imagine what it was like, you know, we talk about the, the, the joy of Peter and the faith of Peter as he stepped out on the boat and began to walk towards Christ. But sometimes we forget about what it must have felt like when his faith suddenly faded as he looked and saw the waves around him. Christ was within, within an arm's reach, but immediately he sank. I, but the scriptures don't describe it very clearly whether he slowly started sinking down or if it was just like a block was pulled out from under him and he just suddenly dunked it down into the sea. I don't know. I personally think that he probably just suddenly fell into the sea. And can you imagine being this man who's walking on top of the water and then fear strikes you and then the water's walking on top of you? In that moment, I can imagine Peter knowing he's close to Jesus, knowing he's right there, and yet feeling helpless, feeling as if God was too far away. So often the storms in our lives feel just like that. Whether you're someone like me who's struggled with depression when you're at your lowest low, sometimes you ask yourself, where's God? Can I tell you, just like Jesus was with Peter, he's right there. He's never left you alone. He never will. Even if you hear the roaring waves and feel the stinging rains, ask God to calm the storm in your heart. Because he can. But if he doesn't calm the storm altogether... At the very least, he can give you peace through it. 
I'm reminded of Jesus specifically when the disciples woke him up in another story where he calmed the seas. Where the disciples woke him up as he's sleeping and the, the wind and the rains are tossing the boat to and fro and they're afraid the boat's going to sink and Jesus isn't walking on the water this time. He's, he's snoozing and the disciples say, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Jesus didn't get up happily. And I don't know about anybody else. You wake me up from a dead sleep, I'm going to be upset with you. I'm sure Jesus was human too. Just because he didn't sin doesn't mean he didn't get irritated. Just, I'm just saying. So they come and they say, Lord, Lord, don't you care that we're, that we're going to perish? Come on, guys. I'm trying to take a nap. Can't, can't you just have a little bit of faith? I mean, this is, this is how I imagine Jesus approaching it. Can't you, don't you see who's with you? Who cares about the storm outside? God's with you. Can I repeat that to you? Who cares about the storm outside? God's with you. Because sometimes when God stills the storm, it's not the one raging outside, it's the one inside that he's got to still so that you can hold on as the boat rocks back and forth. Sometimes the peace that we need isn't the, the environment, it's us. I can't speak for everybody else, but I'm familiar enough with family dynamics to know that any time, now brother and sister Bentley, they're, they're elders here, and they, they've got a lot of experience in marriage, and they can, feel free, brother and sister Bentley, if, to correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure I'm going to get a big amen out of them. When, when you go to work, and you come home from work, and you're grumpy, it doesn't matter how good of a mood your spouse is in, the environment in the house shifts. There we go. I've got an amen from my elder. I know I'm on point. Because when you bring a storm into a calm environment, it becomes contagious. No wonder God is more focused about calming the storm inside than calming the storm outside. Because often enough, we are the cause of the storm outside. You see, calming the sea is only in God's job description. Many fishermen and sailors have cursed the winds and waves, hoping to calm them to their assured safe passage. But no matter how fervent, no matter how sincere, their best efforts couldn't dry a single raindrop. They couldn't cast out a single cloud. However, when God speaks, creation must obey. When God speaks, the winds cease immediately. When God speaks, the clouds disappear immediately and the sun begins to shine. Perhaps this is why the disciples were in such awe, when Jesus, uh, awe of Jesus when, he had, when they had just whisked away the, the waves in the past, but they kept on crashing. But when Jesus spoke, instant peace. See, let's go back to the day Jesus stilled the storm to watch it unfold. Jesus had just set sail aboard a boat with his 12 disciples. These weren't the seven seas, but the Sea of Galilee was just like any other sea. It was unforgiving. Some have, have, uh, some have said that the sea is a brutal mistress. Because at any minute and without warning, the warm air from the water would dance with the cold air from the mountain and produce a practical hurricane. But this night, all was calm. Always beautiful. A handful of the disciples, they were fishermen. They knew their way around the water. They knew, they knew what it's like to sail the seas. They knew what it was like to, to, uh, to weather the storms. But without warning, they spiraled from a calm cruise to rowing for their lives in minutes. Perhaps the reverent quiet of the synagogue that they had heard the rabbi read Read of the noise of the seas and the waves, and of their waves, recorded in the 65th Psalm. Perhaps they'd heard sermons preached over the years of the power and the might of God, and how everything can be in utter turmoil, but God can still it. But this day, they were living it. 
It wasn't a sermon in a building, comfortable padded chairs. This was life. The disciples worked their rescue mission. They grabbed their oars and tried to keep the the boat afloat. They probably were tending to the sails, hoping they wouldn't rip off the mast. Probably some had buckets and bailing water out. But they were none the safer. After all attempts to save themselves proved futile, the disciples staggered to find Jesus somehow sleeping in the hull. Because you see, the, the man of God, he had spent the last little while with the rigors of ministering and healing the hurting, and he had been, been pouring out of himself, and this day Jesus was exhausted. They woke him up with a startling question, Mark 4 and 38, Master, don't you care that we perish? Have you ever wondered if God cares about what you're going through? Have you ever looked at your situation and say, God, do you even care what happens to me? I know years ago, three years ago to be exact, our church was going through a really dark time. And as we were going through that time, I recall standing behind this pulpit, kneeling at this altar, nobody else in the building but me. And I wasn't sure if I was angry with God or angry with myself. Because as far as I could tell, I'd brought it on us. Everything that happened here was my fault, or at least that's what I thought. But then I'm reminded of the dream and the prophecy God gave me, letting me know what was coming. And I'm just, I'm sitting there wrestling with it. God, am I, am I at fault? Did I, did I cause a church split? Did I cause problems? And then I was followed with, God, do you even care about us? Do you even care what happens to fresh anointing? Do you care that our ship is going down? I know I'm not the only one who's ever prayed those prayers. But I can tell you, the same way that Jesus did in the first century there as he does here, Jesus did care. Jesus did meet me in that storm. Jesus did meet his disciples in their storm. And Jesus will meet you in your storm. See, Jesus, he was on the boat with them. So Jesus fully appreciated and understood the danger that they were in. However, he knew something they didn't. He knew that he was the commander of all creation. That just a simple sentence would calm the storm. And as far as all we, as far as we know from biblical history, the miracle had never happened before. God used nature in the Old, in the Old Testament to do his work. We never... Uh, we, we discovered last week that God may have called on the weather to help deliver his people out of the Egyptians, uh, out of Egyptian bondage when he split the Red Sea. God upset the Philistines with thunder during one battle and the stars and the river fought against uh, uh, Sisera and his army in the, in the days of the judges during another battle. God had proven that he can send the storm. And in fact, God had still the, the sun in the sky so that the Israelites could win a battle. God had proven that he could use all of creation for his glory. But the disciples had never heard a story where God stopped the storm. Author Charles Dudley, Charles Dudley Warner quipped that everyone talks about the weather, but nobody ever does anything about it. Jesus woke to the, the pleas of his faithless followers. And he didn't just speak about the weather. He didn't just say, oh guys, I, I understand the storm is great. I understand the, the winds are blowing, the waves are rocking. No, he spoke to the weather. The disciples spoke to him. He spoke to 
the weather, and he looked at it and just said, peace, be still. And immediately the wind ceased. And the Bible describes in Mark 4 and 39 that there was, quote, a great calm. Because with Jesus, there was no small miracle. Jesus spoke to the raging tempest in the middle of the night when, when he and his followers were about to capsize, or so they thought, in a fishing boat in the Sea of Galilee. And in a moment's notice, he calmed the storm. Two thousand four was known as the year of hurricanes for Floridians. Four hurricanes struck the Sunshine State in that one year. Hurricane Charlie was the first first name storm to make landfall that year. A couple, uh, a young couple, they had just bought a house just the year prior, and they were doing their best to keep it intact through their first hurricane. And as the storm swirled outside, they heard shingles being ripped off the building. They didn't know what to do. They were afraid to do anything. But worse yet, they were more afraid to do nothing. So the husband went to the patio door and held his ear up to the glass to see if he could hear how intense the, rains and, the rain and winds were. And the door was shaking in its track. After the outer bands of the hurricane passed overhead, the eye of the store was directly over them. He had a temporary calm. He had peace for just a moment, but the worst was still yet to come. For those who have never been through a hurricane, the tail of the hurricane tends to sting more than the head. And this time, it surely did sting for them. It was terrifying for this couple to sit through a storm inside of a 1,071 square foot house. It would have been terrifying to sit through a storm such as that in a 30-foot fishing boat on the water in the middle of the night. And as the boat tossed and listed, the disciples thought they were as good as gone. They knew that they were, they were dead, but Jesus, you see, Jesus was aboard the boat. And he calmed their storms, and doubtless life's storms are equally as terrifying I remember 2022, I don't know that I've shared this story with the Bentleys, just after the turmoil here at the church finally had calmed down, September 14th of 2022 comes by. I have this great job, making good money, unlimited vacation, work 100% from home. September 14th, 2022, I have a, a meeting with my boss's boss. He just sends me this meeting invite. It's like, okay, no problem. Jump on there, and he's like, hey, Mike, so uh, I need to let you know this, and I'm doing this so that your boss didn't have to. Um, we're laying off 25% of our workforce, and you're in that 25%. I'm sorry, but your job is terminated effective immediately. He said, here's a three-month severance package. You have three months' salary, no insurance. You can purchase insurance if you'd so like. You can keep all the computer equipment we sent you. That's, you can keep that as part of your severance. And I'm sitting here thinking, what good is a computer if I don't have a job? And so immediately after, after the church split, after the, everything went to, to chaos here, finally it's just like, okay, God, I can breathe again. And then September 14th happens, it's like, I can't, I can't catch a break, Lord. And I remember that day, I tried to sit through a couple more meetings as they were working out the plans for the team and so I could pass off some of my duties and some of my knowledge to other team members. And finally, I said, guys, I'm just going to send you an email because I, for obvious reasons, I was upset. I was the only one making money in our home. Stephanie didn't have a job. We didn't want her to have a job. I, I wanted to work and allow her to homeschool our boys. And then all of a sudden, we go from having a good, steady income to nothing. And I'm sick. 
And I'm praying and I'm crying to God and God, what is going on here? How, how can we, how are we going to make ends meet? Because at this point in time, the church didn't have enough income to pay all the bills, so some of them I was paying. And now it's like, God, so the church is going to be hurting from this. And by the end of that day, the Lord spoke to me. Not in these exact words, but the principle was still the same. And said, I just brought you through a worse storm. Don't you think I could take you through this? By September 15th, my demeanor had changed. Yeah, I don't have a job, but that's all right. God knows what he's doing. I have no clue what God's doing, but you know what? We're going to be okay. And some of you have heard the story. By, what was it? January the next year, right as my severance pay was, you know, I'm writing the last check I can write to pay my bills. I get a call from a, uh, from a headhunter, from somebody looking for a job for me. They're like, hey, Mike, how would you like to have this job? And they told me the salary. They told me the, the benefits. It was literally two times what I was making. And in that moment, I'm just like, God, you did know what you were doing, didn't you? Because to be completely honest with you, I never would have been looking for that job had I still had the other one. And to this day, I'm still working at that same level. I'm still working with unlimited, uh, unlimited vacation. I work 100% from home, or rather from my church office. It's much quieter here at the church. I work 100% from here. I, I have all of the luxuries that I need from a job. And God just looked at me and said, Sometimes I need to calm the storm in you. See, I don't know what, what you might be going through this morning. I don't know what storms you are facing. But in a matter of two years, <clears throat> in a matter of two years, I faced the biggest storms of my life. The two most important things, uh, aside from my family, were hit hard our church, and my career. But look around you, church. We're not starting Sunday school with one person in the sanctuary any longer. I'm not sitting on a career making half of what I make now. No, because when you go through the storms, if you'll but hold on to Jesus Christ, let me tell you something, friend. You'll come out better on the other side because that moment Jesus says, peace, be still, there is no question in your mind, no question in your heart that the one you serve is God Almighty. You see, he is well able to calm every tempest. Well able to calm every fear. And sometimes he calms one. Sometimes he calms the other. Sometimes he'll calm both. But at all times, he is in control. At all times, you can trust him in the middle of your storm. You know, it was just last week those who were here Sunday night, you saw a very, very powerful move of God. Sister Becca Malden was refilled with the Holy Ghost after years of believing God couldn't touch her or love her anymore. Just right back over there, right beside where Arthur is sitting. I remember being over there praying with her. And the Lord began to speak to her. And I'm not going to share what he spoke because that was for her, not for you. But I remember the Lord beginning to speak to her and he began to list off the storms she'd been going through. And to see the look on her face is only to interpret, interpret it as Jesus in the boat with his disciples that he wakes up and says, guys, I'm here. It was like in that moment she realized, God, you're here? And the sweet presence of the Holy Ghost fell and she fell to her knees speaking in tongues. She hasn't done that in years. She's living for God. She's seeking after God. She's pursuing God now when she used to run from him. Because friends, this is what happens when you trust God in your storm. 
When you say, Lord, I, I, I know things seem chaotic. I know things seem out of hand. God, I don't even see you in this, but I'm going to trust you have it. I wish to God more people would trust him in the middle of their storm. What's interesting is in practically the same breath that Jesus used to rebuke the wind and the waves, he rebuked his, his disciples. Mark 4 and 4, uh, verse 40, he said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? In Mark's gospel, the disciples had already witnessed Jesus deliver the demoniac in Capernaum, heal Peter's mother-in-law of a fatal fever, touch a leper, and the leper become clean rather than him becoming unclean, heal and forgive a paralytic who was lowered through the roof of a building, and restore a withered man's hand in a synagogue. And while they were awed at all Jesus could do to heal, to heal the others, they were not at all sure about him caring enough to save their lives. But he did. And this miracle on Galilee's stormy sea proved that Jesus is able and, will, and willing to heal. It proved how quickly faith can be shaken. It proved how quickly we can go from, well, just like the prophet Elijah, go from being at the top of the mountain and killing the 450 prophets of Baal to running from your light, running for your life in the very next day. See, the disciples, they looked at one another and, and asked the telling question, which indicates that they, at this moment, up until this moment, they still didn't quite understand who it was that they, that they had with them. Mark wrote in Mark 4 and 41, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Their question betrays their misunderstood theology. They thought Jesus was merely a man who had come to do the work of God. They thought Jesus was a man who had come to become Messiah and to be the deliverer of, of, of Israel, politically speaking. They thought Jesus was a man walking in the will of God. But they had his mission turn around. He was God walking in the flesh of man. He was God walking to do a work to save humanity, not from the oppression of the Romans, but from the oppression of sin. He saved the disciples from their storm that day, and later he saved them from their sins. And although none of the gospel writers Tell us exactly how the disciples responded once the boat hit the beach. Two demoniacs, however, who appeared to be untamable aforetime, ran to Jesus and worshipped him. The storm brewing on the Sea of Galilee was just a drizzle compared to the storm brewing within the city limits of Gadra. But Jesus was about to prove that he was greater than any devil. He was greater than any oppression. He was greater than any possession or depression. On that day, the disciples had all access passes to watch Jesus calm the storm that threatened two demon-possessed men just as miraculously and just as easily as he did the storm that threatened them on the sea. Because you see, Jesus, he truly is God. Jesus truly is Yahweh. He is the Father. And when we, when we see Him as such, when we see our Savior, our God, our King, our Father, there's only one appropriate response, and that's worship, friends. There's only one appropriate response, and that's to raise your hands and to lift your voice as the Spirit of God begins to swirl around you. <laughs> Because see, when you recognize Jesus for who he is, you realize that the storm raging around you has no choice but to bow before him. 
you realize that just at the mention of his name, devils must run and hide. You must recognize that just calling upon the name of our Savior, sickness has to leave. You have no choice but to raise your hands. You have no choice but to worship the King of Kings. Mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not enough paper exists in all the trees, in all the forests of all the world to write all the miracles that Jesus had done. John said in John 21 and 25, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And that was just up to the first century. What about the other 19 centuries from then till now? <laughs> See, we will not exhaust in just this one lesson all the Bible tells us about his miracles, but we have been given a brief glimpse into seeing Jesus for who he is, the sovereign God who performed the specific miracle that the Old Testament identifies as something only Yahweh can do. I mean, I don't know about you, but there, there's no greater one God scripture than that when Jesus says, peace be still, and the Old Testament says, only Yahweh can calm the storm. So why then do we wonder if we can call on the name of Jesus in the midst of our storms? Why then do we wonder if he'll answer if we call upon him in the midst of our battles and our turmoil? We know that not all storms are in boats or on seas. And the writer of this lesson writes this story of his own life. He says, when my wife and I learned, much to our surprise, that our family was in crisis, it seemed to me that we came to the end of our rope very quickly. The crisis involved the disillusion of the marriage of one of our children. We did everything we could think of to try to intervene so that the divorce would be avoided. Nothing seemed to help. Tensions developed, not only between us and our in-laws, but between us and our parents. The storm raged with ever-increasing fury. And it seemed to me that my ministry had come to an end since our family was falling apart. What credibility would I have left? Who would want to listen to anything that I had to say? As I sat in our home one Saturday afternoon, the phone rang. I didn't recognize the caller's voice. But he identified himself. He was calling from approximately 2,000 miles away. And I didn't know him. He said God had awakened him during the night about two weeks before his call and strongly impressed my name upon him. God had given him two verses of scripture for me. Here's the first one. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Isaiah 43 and 2. I was amazed. As a student of scripture, I realized Isaiah wrote these words to Israel. But it seemed perfectly described. It seemed they perfectly described my situation. But there was a second verse. Isaiah 45 and 17. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. So if the God of Israel loves Israel... He also loves you and me. Regardless of the storm that you might face, he's able to speak peace. Maybe your sea is not named Galilee, but when the waters calm, our response will be much like that of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Just like the writer marveled at that phone call and at those scriptures, so too shall you. When you see the hand of Jesus, speak your peace. Amen. Amen. We're drawing Sunday school to a close now, so we're going to take a break for about five or ten minutes as we get ready for worship. Um, I do see some friends walk in. Sister Star, Brother Chris, love to have you guys. I'm thankful to have you guys with us. Amen. For those who don't know, Brother Chris Johnson actually serves with me on the uh, children's team, so I...